So hi, everyone. I have the honor of introducing today's live event, Are There Alternatives to Pelvic Floor Muscle Training to Treat Female Stress Urine Incontinence? And we'll start off with a short introduction of, uh, of us presenting today, and I will go on with some practicals, and then we'll start the presentation. And probably many of you know Cardi Boer from her long commitment to women's health, and the field of women's health is also growing, and that with many new colleagues has arrived. So I'll try to make a short description or short presentation of what Cardi Bu has achieved during her career so far. So she is a trained physical therapist and an exercise scientist, and she had her and she did her PhD in the 1990s, and she was appointed a full professor in 1997, and she was actually the first uh, vice president of the WCPT, that is the International Organization of Physical Therapists for Women's Health. She has her position at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences, and also, she also has a sport position at Akershus University Hospital as a project leader, and both are located in Oslo, Norway. She has published over or close to 300 peer-reviewed um, scientific papers and also given numerous international keynote presentations worldwide. And she has, present, uh, she has um, supervised 19 PhD students and has eight uh, currently under supervision. She's an honorary member of several physiotherapy women's health subgroups in Norway and also in Brazil and in Chile. And probably many of you know Cardi best from her work on pelvic floor muscle training for incontinence in women, as this lecture is about. And in 2014, her paper on this topic was ranked as one out of top 15 trials in the Pedro database, which some of you may know of, especially physiotherapists. She's also been awarded for her substantial impact to research and education in women's health. And with that, the Mildred Nelson Award in 2015, which is the highest, uh, the most prestigious award from the WCPT. And in 2016, she received the um, International Continent Society Lifelong Achievement Award for the same impact on women's health. So I will go on then presenting Merete. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Merete Kolbe Tenfjör is a physical therapist with a specialization within women's health and has a master degree in international health. She defended her PhD in 2017 on the topic uh, sexual function among pregnant and postpartum women with me as a supervisor. Merete is currently working as an associate professor at Christiania University College in Oslo, Norway, and has a 20% position at Akershus University Hospital, working clinically with women's health. Her fields of interest are pregnancy, physical activity, and pelvic floor dysfunction. She currently leads a project on the association between physical activity and endometriosis associated symptoms and is also involved in a project in Ethiopia to improve knowledge among health personnel about the prevention of birth related injuries. She is the former leader of the Norwegian Physiotherapy Association subgroup of women's health representing Norway in the International Organization of Women's Health within the WCPT. And she's still in the board of this organization in Norway. Yeah, thank you, Kari. Um, so before Kari sort of enters the scene uh, live, I will shortly go on with some practicals. And we do, we do hope for an interactive session and therefore encourage you all to submit questions on the web page. And I guess hopefully you all have succeeded logging in or uh, at least event, uh, going on to the event. And then for, to be able to um, drop comments, you need to sign in with your email and then comment there on the event page. Just scroll down and you'll find the comment box. Um, uh, I will then uh, keep an eye on the incoming questions. They will post them to Cardia after her speech. So she will talk for about 40 minutes or so, and there's a time for 15 to 20 minutes for questions afterwards. So Kari was one of the first people doing research in this field, probably from us of training for stress urine incontinence in the 1990s. And although there are high levels of evidence for pelvic floor muscle training to treat stress urine incontinence, they're still popping up alternatives to this training. And that is what we're going to talk about today. The floor is yours, Kari. Okay, thank you. I'll just try to share the screen now with you. Okay. So 
Here we go. I have chosen a quite controversial topic because I think it's important to debate uh, this and that we can have a good uh, debate uh, and respectful uh, debate on what we are doing in clinical practice and is that really evidence-based. So I will start with some thought based on Aaron Antonovsky, who is a philosopher, and he has said that to understand the ill, we must first understand what is healthy. And if we are talking about an intact and well-functioning pelvic floor, this is ligaments, fascias, and the pelvic floor muscles acting together to counteract the impact of any increase in intra-abdominal pressure and ground reaction forces. The pelvic organs are kept in place with little downward movements, and there is little or no opening of the levator hiatus area or the urethra during activity. This is an automatic function, and for women, like most of us, I guess, with a well-functioning pelvic floor and no symptoms, there is no need to think about voluntarily contracting the pelvic floor muscles. It's there in place, and it is acting. So stress urinary incontinence is complaint of involuntary loss of urine on effort or physical exertion, for uh, example, giving sporting activities or on sneezing or coughing. Continence relies on maintaining urethral closure pressure at all instances. And this is based on a resting tone and activation of striated and smooth urethral muscles. So within the urethra. The submucosa with prominent vasculature is also important. And there is a big debate actually on the role on estrogen, but some role, I guess it must be. Uh, resting tone and contraction of the perifloor muscles in addition to these other factors. And degree of downward movement and opening of the urethra during exercise. So what happens when we are doing a voluntary pelvic floor muscle contraction? There is a constriction of the levator hiatus with the urethra, vagina, and anus. And this was uh, uh, measured 25% on ultrasonography by Brecken and coworkers in 2009. There is also several studies on increase in maximum urethral closure pressure during a contraction, which is ranged from 6 to 47.3 centimeter and even higher in the study by Shafik and Shafik. There is a co-contraction of the urethral sphincter muscle when we are contracting the pelvic floor muscles voluntarily. And the muscle length is shortening with, one, with 21%. There is a forward and upward movement of about one centimeter. And this creates a resistance to downward movement. At the same time, when we are contracting the pelvic floor, there is an inhibition of the detrusor contraction. But we're not going to talk about this uh, last point because this is the theoretical framework for doing pelvic muscle training for urgency urinary incontinence and overactive bladder symptoms, but that's not the topic of today. So this understanding was taken into what Miller and co-workers called the NAC in 1998. So they had 27 uh, women with mean age of 68.4 with mild to moderate stress urinary incontinence. They were taught to contract voluntarily the pelvic floor muscle before and during a cough. And then they were sent home just to do that without any other uh, additional training. And they found that this should use the urine loss from medium to deep cough by an average of 98 and 73%. So a huge difference of doing this. Further on studies in this has shown the effect of the NAC with 64 non-pregnant and 29 pregnant women in this study. They found that in the non-pregnant group, the wetted area decreased from medium 43.2 to uh, 6.9. And in the pregnant women, it decreased from 14.8 uh, square centimeter to zero. So it really works in stopping uh, incontinence from occurring. In the latest randomized controlled trial, they uh, had one group randomized to NAC tutorial program, and then the other group had a diet or exercise tutorial. 
The results after one month of doing this showed the significant improvement of 71% in the NAC group compared to 25% in the diet exercise group. And self-perceived -perceive improvement was 21% uh, to 22% higher in the NAC tutorial group. So this works. But what happens if we do this as a training, not only to stop or prevent urinary incontinence uh, with one contraction at the time that it may happen, but that we are actually training the muscle using strength training principle. This RCT looked at morphological changes after six months of strength training of the pelvic floor muscles. This was a randomized controlled trial on 109 women. They had pelvic organ prolapse. And in addition, uh, some of them also had stress urinary incontinence. And we are looking at the differences here between the training and the control group. So muscle thickness increased by 15.6%. This would be exactly the same that we could expect if we were training our bicep muscles. The height area was reduced by 6.3% or 1.8 square centimeter. The muscle length was also reduced by 4.2% or 6.1 millimeter. We lifted the bladder neck by 4.3 millimeter and the rectal ampulla with 6.7 millimeter. So these are the permanent morphological changes that are occurring when you are doing strength training of the pelvic floor muscles. And it's, as you all know, it's very difficult to measure automatic function. But in this study, we tried to do that by using ultrasonography and looking at what happened when they were asked to strain. And we found that in the exercise group, the peripheral muscle training group, the height area was much less and significantly less uh, during straining, uh, indicating an automatic function and increased peripheral muscle stiffness. This needs much more investigation, but there are also now other studies finding the same after uh, some time with strength training of the pelvic floor muscles. So, Today, there is anatomical, biological, biomechanical, and exercise science rationale for doing the NAC or the strength training, and these are actually building on the same. It's the contraction of the pelvic muscle that can create these changes within the body uh, of the pelvic muscles to treat stress urinary incontinence, and also I would add pelvic organ prolapse, although we are not talking about that today, but there is also now one a level of evidence recommendation for pelvic muscle training for that. So we are actually building our principles of pelvic muscle training on this model that shows that the pelvic floor here is the water that keeps the organs in place. And this is what we can modify by strength training. And the pelvic floor muscles are the only muscles in position to have this function. There are no other muscles that can do this because it's placed underneath and around the openings. And then looking at the evidence for peripheral muscle training versus no or inactive control treatment, this is the Cochrane review from 2018. Uh, this was based on 31 RCTs and quasi RCTs in 1817 women from 14 countries with a mixture of stress urinary incontinence, urgency urinary incontinence, and mixed urinary incontinence. And if you look at the results of stress urinary incontinence, women who are doing peripheral muscle training are eight times more likely to be cured uh, and six times more likely to be cured or improved. They have better quality of life fewer urinary incontinence episodes and less urinary incontinence on pad test. And the effect is better if you look at stress urinary incontinence uh, trials compared to other diagnoses and also with supervised training. So the ICI also through all the years that this organization has existed have always concluded that peripheral muscle training should be first line treatment. So everything is good. I could be very happy as a physical therapist to have all this evidence and I should know what I could do because this is really convincing that this, this is what we should do. But I'm asking the question, is clinical physiotherapy practice based on this evidence from high quality RCTs or 
are some of us still working on theories, clinical experiences, and statements from practice. So I have been very fortunate to be invited to give presentations uh, in maybe most of the countries in the world. It's been fantastic to meet so many good physical therapists all around the world, but I see huge differences between clinical practices. And I also hear the same questions coming up from some of the clinicians uh, that why are, what about body posture, breathing pattern, motor control, core training, gait analysis? This is something that we should maybe call the core of physiotherapy. This is what we learn in our basic studies in physiotherapy, that this is important. But is it important for everyone and for any condition? It seems to me, and I'm a physiotherapist, I know this very well, that this is what we do for everyone. And then also into the pelvic floor area. But uh, in the latest article from Barry Bergmans in 2020, he and he has been an advocate actually himself for these other functions. Uh, he wrote that there is no evidence or level three or four grade C for any of these um, different areas uh, in the uh, pelvic floor muscle training um, in interventions. And I think the most important thing for physiotherapist, whether it is research physiotherapist or clinical physiotherapist, that we need to be able to separate between postulates and evidence. Exercise science, in my uh, opinion, uh, has not had a strong uh, setting in uh, the physiotherapy curricula in our basic studies. Motor control has been very, very important and has taken a lot of space in our uh, basic studies, but exercise uh, science has not. And especially, I would say, not uh, strength training. So why? are we not focusing on strength training in the basic of physiotherapy? It's very strange because strength training is coming up as so important for so many areas of the body, not only the pelvic floor, but for a lot of different uh, diagnoses and issues. But it's not been a strong part of our curriculum. So, I think there has been also this uh, contradiction between clinical practice and research. This is very unfortunate because this, in my opinion, should go hand in hand. But some words about why we can't trust clinical experience as um, a method to, <laughs> to, to say that something is working or not. Clinical experience is good for making research questions. There's no doubt about it. It's really what I uh, miss most when I'm only doing my research uh, is uh, to work with the patients and to have their experiences that I can use in my understanding of the problems. And it's really important for us as researchers. And fortunately, I'm I have still a lot of contact with patients because they are calling me and they are sending me questions on email. So I don't feel that I'm away and all my research is clinical research. So then I also meet with the patients, but it doesn't tell the truth and cannot answer research questions because it doesn't control for the threats to internal validity. It cannot tell what would be the case without the intervention. And there is a certain confirmation bias and from us because we see what we want to see in clinical practice and the patients, they are also eager to please us and they don't want to say, well, it didn't really work, but yes, I feel a bit better. We all know that. And in clinical practice, practice there is seldom measurement of outcome. And if there is, still this cannot tell the effect size of the intervention. And I'm sorry to tell for those of you who are not doing research, but for us who have done several RCTs, any concept you put into a high quality RCT has less effect than clinical experience. It's due to the fact that we are blinded, we are not interfering with what we are doing. So this is not going to be 
as good as we think it is in clinical practice. That's been my problem as well, because I remember my first RCT, I was certain that everyone would get better. And it was 60%. The medical doctor said this was fantastic. And I was very disappointed. But this is how it is. Nothing can cure everybody. So what is internal validity? You can see here uh, the pyramid of evidence where we have ideas, opinions, editorials, anecdotal uh, stories um, uh, at the bottom. And then we go up this pyramid and we are now only talking about research for uh, looking at interventions. So the effect of physiotherapy and systematic reviews on the top. And why is this? Oh, sorry. Um, because internal validity means that to which extent the changes observed are caused by the experiment, the intervention or physiotherapy and not by confounding factors. And there are several threats, threats to uh, internal validity from clinical practice. If we look at RCTs and we can dislike or like RCTs, uh, we know that they, uh, they have the best internal validity because there are so many confounding factors like history. Something happens at the same time as they are coming to physiotherapy and this is really what makes them worse or better. Maturation is a big problem during pregnancy and after childbirth because there is a natural uh, uh, resolution of the problems. Testing situation is also uh, important because if we test the patients, then they learn from the test itself and it has nothing to do uh, with what they have been doing, but actually the testing is to make, making them better after some while. Instrumentation, meaning that we have to have a, a very good calibration of the instrument that we are using, and this can also change from time to time, so it doesn't really mean that the change we see is due to the intervention. Statistical regression is the most important factor because things are going up and down also when uh, you, even we're talking about stress union incontinence it's not always uh, it's not always stable uh, the condition and it is a tendency in all studies that this will try to get towards the mean that's just a mathematical thing so this happens all the time so that's why we need rcts to look at this and variation and to have a blinded uh, investigator Selection biases that we are just picking those who we think can get better and not the, the whole uh, population. Experimental mortality, which is a big problem in uh, anything that they just uh, do not do what they are asked to do and uh, what they are also then uh, dropping out uh, of the, the study or the intervention itself. And then the combination of the two selection and maturation uh, interaction. And of course, not uh, not least at the end, expectancy. And again, uh, what we think and how we are actually uh, also uh, influencing our patients and put words in their mouth, so to say, that aren't you getting better? Yes, I feel a bit better. So RCTs, that's why we are doing them. It's very hard to do, but they are controlling for most of these factors. So is there evidence for alternative exercises to treat uh, stress urinary incontinence? Um, this, I think, came out for the first time uh, in 2001-2004, where, uh, where one of our colleagues in Australia uh, said that abdominal muscle training to rehabilitate the peripheral muscle may be useful in treating urinary and fecal incontinence. And this was based on a small abstract where they concluded that the findings of this study indicate that exercise of the abdominal muscle may be beneficial in maintaining peripheral muscle coordination, support, endurance, and strength. It was actually showing that there was some uh, association between the two. So many studies have looked into this afterwards, and we had also a systematic review on this, uh, which did not support this finding. However, we need a randomized control trial to look into new uh, postulates or hypotheses like this. 
So uh, Chantal Dumoulin came out with this excellent study in 2004. This was a single blind random control trial, assessor blinded, and it started at least three months postpartum. It was an eight weeks intervention. It was once a week with a physiotherapist and five days a week at home. Uh, the first group had peripheral muscle training plus electrical stimulation. The other group had exactly the same plus transverse abdominal training. And then the third group was a control group and they had massage. And this is, was fantastic because it really controlled for uh, the fact that they had a lot of attention. So it was the same attention and a very good attention in the control group. The results found 70% cure rate in both treatments group, treatment groups and no cure in the control group, but the control group improved quality of life. And this was disease specific quality of life. It also tells about an importance of having outcome measures that is not only based on what the patient think because massage was pro probably very, very good for their quality of life, but it didn't change their incontinence. But the main finding in this study was that there was no additional effect of adding transverse abdominal training to peripheral muscle training. Another study looked at the same. This was 68 women with stress during incontinence, and they were randomized to 12 weeks of peripheral muscle training every day, peripheral muscle training three days per week, or peripheral muscle training plus abdominal training three days per week. And again, they didn't find any difference in pad test or satisfaction, which was their primary outcome. There are also some experimental studies in this area. And this was one of the studies we did when I was in Melbourne in 2000 and uh, was published in 2002. We used suprapubic ultrasonography uh, in 20 physiotherapists from Australia. And the results show that also one of these physiotherapists who were expecting to be doing this correctly was not uh, having a correct contraction of the pelvic floor muscle because there was a downward movement when she was trying to contract the pelvic floor muscles. Six of these 20 physiotherapists, that's 30%, had a downward movement when they were during, do, uh, doing a transverse abdominal contraction. And when we measured the lift, uh, with ultrasonography, uh, the peripheral muscle uh, contraction uh, caused 11.2 millimeter lift, transverse abdominal 4.3, and then add peripheral muscle contraction to transverse. It was raised again to 8.5, but not as high as with peripheral muscle contraction alone. In another study at our university hospital, 13 women with stage one to three pelvic organ prolapse was assessed by POPQ and mean age in this group was 46.5 years and parity was 2.6, BMI was at the normal range. They had instruction of a correct transverse abdominal contraction and this was verified by palpation and ultrasonography. We used 4D perineal ultrasound in this study and looked at area of the levator hiatus, transverse and anterior posterior dimensions, muscle length. The results show that uh, peripheral muscle contraction uh, led to a constriction of the levator hiatus of 24%, while transverse abdominus was 9.5%, and this was a significant difference in favor of peripheral muscle contraction. The muscle length we found the same, it was much higher in peripheral muscle contraction compared to transverse abdominal contraction. And all women had constriction during peripheral muscle contraction, but two women opened up during transverse abdominal contraction. And this is what we don't want when we are doing uh, peripheral muscle training or trying to restore function of the peripheral muscles. So I, also include in this talk the polar method. I know that this is not uh, commonly used throughout the world, but I was uh, um, presented for this uh, uh, intervention uh, when I was visiting Israel some years ago, and it's been used in the Middle East. The theory for the polar method is that if you act uh, activate distant sphincters, it also affects other muscles. So contracting around your mouth or closing your eyes should then lead to contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, 
This was a single blind randomized controlled trial with 59 women with stress urine incontinence or mixed urine incontinence. The POLA method had individual 45 minutes weekly, including pelvic floor muscle training, and then daily 15 to 45 minutes at home for 12 weeks. Then the other randomized group had pelvic floor muscle training, and as you can see, very different dosage. Group training, 30 minutes weekly for four weeks, and then daily 15 minutes at home, and they were phoned by a physiotherapist every second week. They found that both groups had a significant reduction in PAT test. And there were no change in peripheral muscle strength measured by manometry. Quality was better in the polar group only. In this study, there were no comparison between groups, and that's why you do RCTs, that you should compare the difference in change between the groups. However, they added another much bigger RCT with 240 uh, women with stress urine incontinence, and they used the same uh, um, intervention programs uh, as they did in the first trial. They didn't find any significant difference between the groups in PAD test or quality of life, uh, but the number with less than one gram was significantly higher in the polar group. They had a six month follow up and this found the same results with the same limitations and with 40% drop up. So, what are the limitations? I guess some of you have already uh, seen it that there were protocol differences between these two groups and very huge differences in dosage and attention in favor of the polar group. Polar the POLA group also included peripheral muscle training, so we cannot say whether it was the actual training of the peripheral muscle or whether it was the closing of the mouth or the eyes. The dropout was 21.4% in peripheral muscle training and 31.7% in the POLA method. So uh, there are also experimental studies trying to look into what actually happens when you're doing the POLA method. So this was the first study coming out uh, from our group with the uh, 4D perineal ultrasound, uh, sound, uh, ultrasound sorry. Uh, and this was based on a power calculation. So we had 17 pregnant or postpartum women participating in the study. And there was a significant reduction of levator hiatus area and muscle length only after pelvic floor muscle contraction. We concluded that there was no, was no facilitation of pelvic floor muscle during constriction of the mouth. And very interesting, at the same time, and without knowing of each other, the, this Brazilian group from Resende and co-workers, they did an experimental study on the polar method with surface EMG. So different methods and different ways of doing this. They had 34 healthy nulliparous women participating, and the results showed no activation of the peripheral muscles during polar, and no additional effect of adding polar to the pelvic floor muscle uh, contraction. So they concluded that there were no activation during polar. So how can it then work? It's a question. So there has been also a lot of um, debate and again on breathing. There are some uh, studies on breathing and uh, pel uh, pelvic floor. Uh, in this study with the uh, seven participants, uh, there was increased peripheral muscle EMG activity uh, in expiration. In another study, they found a positive correlation between peripheral muscle strength and forced expiratory flow. And in this uh, epidemiological study with a lot of participants, also this is based on questions only, they found that disorders of breathing and continence was associated with low back pain. But what does this mean, especially this last study? I mean, are we really surprised that if you have a problem with um, uh, breathing, uh, for instance, you have a uh, asthma or bronchitis, and you are coughing a lot, that there is an association with incontinence on that. This, these studies are not cause uh, effective. Other studies have found no change in intra-abdominal pressure with holding breath or exhaling during abdominal or other exercises. 
And in this study from Shaw and uh, co-workers, there were no change in intradermal pressure with breathing. So I think we need a lot more uh, um, information and understanding of how breathing may affect uh, the uh, pelvic floor, or if there is any point in adding breathing exercises, we do have no RCTs on this. Another question is, what about use of other muscle groups uh, instead or in addition to the pelvic floor? Uh, I was happy to work with uh, Jenny Kruger for uh, some years ago uh, in my sabbatical uh, in New Zealand. And again, I would like to thank all the New Zealand uh, physiotherapists who attended uh, this uh, study. We had 21 volunteers uh, from our colleagues, so that was great. Uh, we uh, use these new apparatus uh, that Jenny is uh, now developing and this apparatus aims to at the same time uh, assess both intra-abdominal pressure and the response from the pelvic floor muscles. We found that co-contractions of the pelvic floor muscle during contraction of other muscle groups are mostly minor. Compared to contraction of other muscles, intra-abdominal pressure is significantly lower during a peripheral muscle contraction. Uh, and for instance, as you can see, uh, probably difficult to see, uh, but you can see in the article, uh, during cough and uh, abdominal training, the intra-abdominal pressure is very high, but during peripheral muscle contraction, the intra-abdominal pressure is very, very low. So exercising accessory muscles in an attempt to activate the pelvic floor muscle sufficiently to elicit a training effect is not recommended based on these findings. This study uh, on external and internal hip rotators was an RCT with 27 women with stress urinary incontinence and they were randomized to six weeks of home training plus, plus phone uh, and two visits with a physiotherapist. One group had external and internal rotator training a hip rotator, and the other group had pelvic floor muscle training. They didn't find any differences between the groups. And the hip rotator group had slightly steeper improvement tra trajectory. However, again, there are limitations to the study. The numbers are small. There are no palpation or supervision of the pelvic floor muscle training. And what about dosage and duration? So there has also been some suggestion that posture is important for the pelvic floor. Uh, this is one statement, poor posture can lead to the dysfunction of the pelvic floor. And another statement, non-optimal strategies for posture, movement and or breathing create fade load transfer, which can lead to urinary incontinence. Again, it's very important for us all to um, separate between what is postulates and hypothesis, and what is based on some investigation. And these are just postulates. There is one uh, study on this so far, as I've been able to find, and this is the Global Postural Reeducation uh, Study from Fossati in Brazil. And they found that this was better results than doing peripheral muscle training alone. Uh, the, this was a non randomized trial. There were different dosages and attention in the study. And the last uh, um, study or hypothesis in this area is, can the peripheral muscle training, be, uh, peripheral muscle be trained during physical activity? And this is called involuntary reflex peripheral muscle training. Um, this was a hypothesis and I would like to congratulate this group in Switzerland because they really put their postulate or hypothesis into a randomized control trial. And this was a high quality randomized control trial. 96 women with urinary incontinence were randomized to 16 weeks of either standard peripheral muscle training or standard peripheral muscle training plus running and jumping because the hypothesis is that if you are doing these activities then there will be a reflex contraction of the pelvic floor muscle. They didn't find any additional effect of adding involuntary reflexive peripheral muscle training to pelvic floor muscle training alone and this was measured by surface EMG measuring of pelvic muscle strength and also using the ICIQ urinary incontinence short form. So no effect on that. So to uh, round up, 
what does it really mean for us to work evidence-based on in this area? Is it ethical to do other things instead of or in addition to peripheral muscle training if there is no evidence? And I'm always curious to know why this interest? Is it because, and that may well be the case, that many physiotherapists, especially the new ones coming into this area, maybe coming from other areas like uh, musculoskeletal, they are not aware of the evidence, so they don't know what to do. So they are doing what they usually do in the clinical practice for other uh, uh, diagnoses. There is obviously an English language problem because the evidence is written in English. And for instance, the Spanish um, speaking countries not always uh, read English uh, scientific literature. Is it because there are strong believers in their own clinical experience and they want to do that, whatever the evidence is? Is it because they don't want to palpate, so therefore they choose to do other things instead, so they don't have to worry about the palpation? Or is it because physiotherapists are like surgeons, we want to have you know, our own method and to be rich and famous because of that? I'm concerned because patients themselves are telling the medical doctors that they had physiotherapy and the medical doctors are also saying, and the surgeons are saying they had had physiotherapy, no effect, so we go on with surgery. And this is not correct if they haven't done it correctly. This cost is costly, it takes time, and it also brings a lot of frustration, both for the patient and for the physiotherapist. And I think that our patients deserve evidence-based physiotherapy because it's there, we can use it, and we can use the protocols that have shown to have effect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kari, for the really uh, nice uh, talk, an interesting talk. It's always a pleasure to listen to you and your knowledge. So um, I'm quite surprised um, that although we have all this exercise, all this evidence for pelvic floor muscle training to, uh, to be effective for stress or urinary incontinence, so why on earth do we keep on questioning them and keep on coming up with all these alternatives? And you do mention, you do mention in your last slide some reasons for it, but could it also be that uh, the physios or the well, health personnel becomes sort of impatient for, for their patients? That's, the patients think it's boring, it's, um, yeah, uh, do we sort of need to spice it up a bit? Do we need to name it differently? Uh, all these new exercises are much more sexy than pelvic floor muscle training. <laughs> so is there any, do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I, first of all, I think we should stop saying ourselves that it's boring because I know, are you thinking that training your biceps is very sexy or very interesting or not boring. I mean, every exercises can be boring. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that, so also with the pelvic floor. But in my experience, if you explain how this can work and they understand it, then a lot of women are actually very motivated to do it. And we can see from many of these trials that we really have high adherence. I saw the last study from Chantal Dumoulin uh, the adherence was really, really high. So I, it, it's our uh, duty, I think, to try to explain and try to uh, have a nice atmosphere and make they really uh, realize how this can uh, work for them. And we know that a lot of women are not exercising uh, other muscles or, or, or are doing uh, what is recommended. I mean, what we want is that everyone should do at least 30 minutes of exercise every day and less than 30% of the birds population are doing that. So this is a common thing, but I, first of all, we must stop saying that this is more boring than doing other things. It's more difficult because some women have injuries to the perineum, to the perineal muscles, to the peripheral muscles. So that's why it can be very hard to do it. But I, I don't buy the thing that it has to be more sexy or something else. I think, I mean, everything can be boring if we look at it as boring. <laughs> 
I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have really got one question uh, uh, from the US that uh, what is the minimum length of doing these exercises? And um, I guess the protocols you have been studying and also the protocols which have been following up at the hospital where our projects have been is that the length of the interval or the length of the study has been four months. And I guess that is the length of the protocol which has been studied uh, with effect. And, uh, and the follow-up question was that if the women stop doing the exercises, how long does the efficacy of the training last? These are very, yeah, <laughs> these are very good questions that I really wish to be able to answer. <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have a very, uh, we don't have very good evidence uh, for that. Uh, the length of the exercise period is true. For the, the studies, they, they are usually now uh, at least three months, uh, and that's what have been used in the study. In, in our studies, we have trained them, them for six months or uh, during pregnancy and after childbirth for four months. So that's a, a longer period of time, and we know for all exercise the training, dosage is the key. So the longer we can do it, the better. Uh, but we can't say, uh, how long they have to do it and also how long it will last. We don't know that, but we have published one um, systematic review on the long-term follow-up and there is good evidence that you can uh, also have a long-term follow-up of paleofromosal training, given that you are continuing to exercise. If you look at the exercise science and we are updating the book now, so I hope with my new co-author on the strength training chapter that we will try to find some new studies on how much is enough. Uh, but um, what we have used now is an old reference and that you should train at least once a week and then to uh, do very uh, close to maximum uh, contraction as the intensity is the main thing here. Uh, it probably uh, will uh, go start to go down after three to four weeks without training. Uh, and in my experience, and Merete, you can add to that because you also have a lot of patients uh, and have had for a long time now, uh, that most women who really get better from this, they can feel it after one to two weeks. Not that they are not leaking anymore, but they can feel a certain, uh, that, um, um, what do you say, uh, that they are more firm uh, and that they, they feel to have more control and they can contract and they can do the knack. Uh, so that, that's, in my opinion, it comes in my experience, it comes quite early that you can say that something happened. You're, you're still leaking, but you, you have some um, um, information from your body that you are uh, improving. Merete, I don't know if you want to add on that. Yeah, I think it's all about the control, as you say that, because what I also feel that uh, sometimes the patients do, they do uh, express that they get better, but there's no, uh, I can't measure <laughs> the improvement. So, and it might be that, as you said, that the patients just want to please me, uh, but hopefully not everybody just wants to please me, but that they do get better because they have more control and they, they get the advice that maybe they haven't uh, gotten before, before they came to a physiotherapist. So, yeah, I do agree that it's not necessarily association also between the improvement in symptoms and then also the the um, the findings on the measurements on the palpation we do. Mm. So in our first RCT, that's a long time ago now, uh, we were actually measuring them every month and they had a six month uh, intervention and we could see a steady increase in the pelvic floor muscle strain throughout uh, that period. And I think if we had continued, it would still have had uh, increased because we see that in other strength training programs that there is uh, increase in muscle strength and endurance and power after six years, uh, six months, uh, one year and so on. So it's it's always impos it's possible to get stronger. But of course there is a floor and ceiling effect in this. So if you start at a very low level, of course you can have a huge improvement so 100% was seen in our study during the first month, telling that they hadn't really trained these muscles before at all. But mm -hmm. then the increase was not that high, but it was continuous and going up and up uh, after that. So if you're starting at a very high level, although you have not trained the pelvic floor muscles before, there is not that much to gain in muscle strength, but 
that may also still change the morpho morphology of the muscles. So you may close the levator hiatus, you may lift and get all these other functions, but not necessarily the strength because you are already strong. But the training itself, because you haven't done that before, will change the morphology of the muscles. Yeah, so now you just answered uh, another question, <laughs> which was the, the association of the improvement of symptoms and the findings, which we are uh, the findings from the more objective measurements. There's another yeah. question uh, from one of the audience that uh, they asked for if the if Pilatus has an effect for stress urine incontinence. And I guess that Pilates does involve uh, a lot of core, but uh, as you also mentioned in your slides, is that if you don't do peliform muscle contraction, then there's no chance, uh, the, the, then the, the effect will be, of course, less than if you just do regular Pilates without the uh, control of how the women actually contract their peliform muscles. Yeah, and, and there is an RCT actually on that is showing that uh, the, the class who did uh, proper peripheral muscle contractions, uh, they had effect, but the other classes who were doing the Pilates exercises without the contraction, they didn't have an effect. So again, it's, uh, it's correct what you're saying, uh, Merete, and we need that. And I, I think we, we also need to know that Pilates was uh, a program that was uh, uh, developed in the early 1920s. And in the early 1920s, there were not much exercise science to build on. Uh, so these are merely exercises without the dosage. I mean, the frequency, intensity, duration, uh, and so on are uh, linked to the exercises. And in all these programs that came out, many other uh, gymnastic programs also at the same time, which was good for women's health, I think, uh, they uh, have, I mean, they use the same exercises, uh, all of them. But again, it's the problem when you think that doing these other exercises can replace actual peripheral muscle contractions. So, of course, you can train the pelvic floor in the Pilates class, which is great. Just as I am including uh, peripheral muscle training in my classes. I, I, treat aerobic, I, I teach aerobic dance and we also have every time a session with peripheral muscle strength training. The point is, as Merete said, that you have to do these exercises just as you do abdominal training, we do gluteal training, we do squats, we do specific exercises for specific muscles and we need to do the same for the pelvic floor. And when you include it in the class, and I was giving a talk a webinar in Australia uh, some weeks ago, and we were talking about group training compared to the other training. And this is back to your first question, Merete, that having the group training setting makes it much more interesting for women. They meet others with the same problems and they can learn from each other. And they can also do other exercises that are important for women's health. This was the concept that we, made back in the 1988 when I started to do these uh, classes and do, did my first RCT. So it was trying to get it more interesting and uh, well, that women would feel that they were also doing other exercises. The, the other exercises has nothing to do with the pelvic floor, but they are there to have a break in the pelvic floor muscle training. And it's also a, a good thing that they are also getting stronger in other muscles. Yeah, but uh, one thing is that, because now you've been talking about all those that actually can contract the muscles, but there are some women that they can't contract the muscles, even though how hard we try, and those that uh, eventually manage to contract after we have rehearsed several times. So, and uh, what do we do with them? <laughs> is there any hope? <laughs> it's also 1,000 crowners uh, question, <laughs> I think. Uh, there is some studies coming up uh, on this. This one from uh, Brazil, uh, and they did an RCT, and they had one group with electric stimulation, one control group, and they had also one with uh, extra palpation and palpation with the uh, 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 tucking in of the, the pelvis, so the curving of the, the pelvis. And they found that uh, doing the palpation uh, in two different ways was more effective than doing elective st stimulation. They also uh, do the same now and have done the same in a new RCT 
uh, and uh, it's about uh, to come into a manuscript now uh, using electrical stimulation. And they found that it may be helpful in some patients. So that's, that's an option, but it doesn't work in everyone. It's hard. And, and sometimes I think, although we don't like it, but as physiotherapists, we must also accept that what we are doing is not going to help everyone. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Oh, no, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's also a study from uh, Norway now, Ingeborg uh, Brekken is also um, um, doing a pilot study on uh, those who cannot contract. That will be also interesting. Is there more research coming up on this field? Yes, yes, and we need that. And I really welcome uh, that sort of research. And I, I know also as physiotherapists, we are using fast stretches, tapping, some massage, trying to, to involve and to, to make women aware of where the muscles are. Uh, so also we need studies uh, into that, uh, I think. Yeah. And I spoke to a physiotherapist uh, actually a couple of days ago and she asked me because she was sort of new in the field and she asked me why doesn't the uh, general uh, practitioners and the gynecologists know that uh, physiotherapy can be or that pelvic floor muscle training can be effective for these women. And I try to sort of defend the uh, subgroup uh, in women's health in Norway that we do try to advocate the message of pelvic floor muscle training but is it should we how should we go about, uh, so there's also a question then from the audience about the same, then how should we, yeah, distribute the information to a wider audience? Should we have more seminars, more uh, live events? <laughs> how should we get the message out? Because it's obviously not common knowledge. <laughs> Yeah. It's an everlasting challenge, I, I think, because it, I, I sometimes I think, oh, I've been talking about this for so many years, so everyone must know it. But we forget that there are new doctors, new nurses, new midwives, new physiotherapists coming out, and they need to have this knowledge. So it's a constant thing that we should all work together to try to get this out. And that's why organizations like the ICS and IUGA and uh, the European uh, Association of Urology, the American, all these places are important that we are sending in abstracts, at, that we are presenting. Uh, and we need to have audiences that are multidisciplinary because if we keep talking together and to each other, we are sort of a, a family <laughs> and we know what we are talking about although we may differ in some aspects, but still uh, we are physiotherapists. So this is not enough. We must be present where all the doctors are and try to give them the evidence because we cannot expect actually uh, that a surgeon who are interested in surgery that he or she should be updated on all other aspects. So there are very few of them actually who are interested in the conservative management, unfortunately, because there is consensus and we should just bang that in all the time that the consensus is first line treatment because we do not have any adverse effect of peripheral muscle training. It's the best way to start because it doesn't really change anything afterwards so they can have surgery if it fails, but it should never be surgery first because we know now that both for prolapse surgery and for stress urinary incontinence, there may be devastating problems and uh, complications afterwards. So again, uh, in a way, it should not be allowed to do surgery first. And also that many women now do, they enter training of fitness centers, uh, they go to personal trainers, or at least they will continue doing that when it opens up. Yeah. And uh, um, the personal trainers, well, some doesn't have the, maybe the knowledge of pelvic floor muscle training and, and many women does in maybe the age group where they can actually have the problems come to see the fitness centers. So mm -hmm. how do we sort of, um, educate the personal trainers, uh, so that can, that they actually does say the word pelvic floor muscles out loud <laughs> and just not <laughs> focusing on the core and hoping that, uh, the pelvic floor muscles will be. Uh, trained by the by the same way. <laughs> Again, I think we all need to work together because I tried this now for 30 years to try to get the fitness industry 
interested in peripheral muscle training and it hasn't been very successful. So uh, it's, I mean, I've been doing it throughout Europe to, using the core uh, wellness uh, DVD and instructed many of them uh, in the fitness center. Again, it's the same problem. It's a young generation, usually being fitness instructors, they usually stop at an age and they, they don't teach anymore. So it's an ongoing thing. Uh, we at our university, we are uh, teaching uh, personal trainers. We try to get it into their curricula as well but it's very hard because they're not used to think about this, but some of them are interested and I think it's it's possible. There is an, it's a study from England showing, and this was a questionnaire, and they, the, the instructors said that they were interested if they were taught how to do the training. So um, again, I need help. I need you all to try to do this. Uh, in your countries, in your uh, specific sport clubs, in the place you live, try to uh, encourage uh, also to do this. Uh, this has another side, of course, because we have already said that it's so many women who are not able to contract the pelvic floor uh, just by uh, telling them to do it. But on the other hand, if 30% are not able to contract, maybe 70% will understand how it is if you explain it in the proper way. And I don't think that the fact that some are not able to contract should stop us from teaching it in a general setting like that. I always do this in my classes. And I also have a sort of an openness saying that if anyone has a problem, they, I can, they can talk to me and I can try to get them to a, a, a physiotherapist who can help them. So just to have this openness and talk about it and have brochures, have model, have DVDs or uh, apps that you could uh, rely on and tell them that this is the way to do it. But if they need more help, they're not able to contract, they don't, under, they don't um, really realize if they are able or not able to contract, then they should go to a trained physiotherapist to get some real help. There is some studies also from Belgium, from uh, Fermantle and uh, Niels group showing that uh, many women, uh, I think it was 8% thought that uh, contracting their um, hip um, muscles was peripheral muscle training. And also some of them uh, thought that straining was the correct contraction. So uh, proper instruction and knowledge is very, very important in this area. Yeah. And I guess that was our, it's, our time is uh, up. Uh, I just wonder if, uh, just very short, is there um, some, uh, some questions and also patients have asked, is there, is there like one app to, uh, to um, um, recommend to, for pelvic muscle training? Because there are tons, there are numerous out there. So is it like one app which is better than the other? <laughs> um, I don't know, actually, but I know that uh, Jean Haysmith has uh, made an article and I think it's soon to be submitted. It's called Absolutely Fantastic, uh, Absolute Fantastic. And it was also presented at the ICS in Gothenburg uh, last year. Uh, and uh, she is looking into the, the different uh, apps. And um, uh, I think also the main message there is that uh, we think that this is increasing adherence, but actually many of these apps are just looked upon once and not used at all. So I don't think that, that this will solve the problem. It can be a help for some, but not everyone likes to use apps uh, either. So again, same problem, adherence yeah. is important. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Kadi, for sharing your knowledge and also to answer the questions uh, for from the audience and also from me. And I guess to sort of round up, uh, if we can conclude now after this uh, hour of talk, is there other alternatives to pelvic floor muscle training to treat female stress during incontinence? For the moment, it is not. And we know that peripheral muscle training is effective. So please do that for the best of our patients. Yeah. So stick to what we know, and also the research has put enormous amounts of um, uh, effort into these uh, studies. So we should work then knowledge-based and research-based. Um, and if you are to use other alternatives, you should study, study them first. <laughs> Uh, so thank you all for listening and contributing in the questions. I'll try to raise the questions. There are a few of which I haven't been able to uh, answer, uh, but I, I hope we have been um, touched upon most of them. 
and I hope you all have a nice and educational evening. And also, there are I've also told by the ICS to announce that there are more ICS um, uh, live events coming up, uh, six of them just before, uh, by the end of June, actually, and by the end of July. So I hope, and also this event can be rewatched and also redistributed to those who are interested. And I do hope that we all can see each other face to face and not just on screen uh, sometime soon. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so uh, I had a nice uh, evening and a lovely summer holiday. So yeah, thank you and uh, goodbye <laughs> from both of us. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>